Hi everybody, I'm here today with Bill Potter, who has been teaching history for over 40 years and is a very distinguished historian. He's incredibly knowledgeable about many people, places, and events from all different time periods of world history. Um, he's been leading for many years history tours throughout the United States and in different countries in Europe. And right now he is the historian for a touring company called Landmark Events. Mr. Potter is also the author of books on Stonewall Jackson and Victorian author G. A. Henty. And finally, he's also an avid historical reenactor and has appeared in a feature film, which we'll talk about later. And he's also been on been in a number of documentaries. Mr. Potter, thank you so much for being on with us. Now, Mr. Potter is not only a very beloved historian, but he's also become a close personal friend of mine. I'm really happy he could be with us today. Thanks, Solomon. Great. So, Mr. Potter, first off, when did you become interested in history? Uh, I kind of date my interest back to when I was, oh, probably in the first grade or second grade in school. Um, we got to spend a year with my paternal grandparents as my father built our home. And my grandfather had a dresser full of photographs, and I was fascinated by all these pictures. It turns out we had a photographer in the family from the 1840s. Hmm. And so we have an, an entire uh, photo history of our ancestors. And so I would beg him to take out the pictures and just t tell me stories and talk to me about them, and which he did. And I think that sparked a real interest in the past. I was probably eight years old when, when that took place. And uh, I, I had an idea of who I was and where I came from and who these people were as a result. And then in later on in the following years, uh, different events occurred that uh, sort of accelerated my interest in history. I read everything I could get my hands on in the school library. And because I'd read every single thing in elementary school, they let me into the high school <laughs> library. And nobody, nobody else, none of my peers, because there wasn't anything I hadn't devoured. <laughs> so, Sounds like Harry Truman. So I, yeah. I knew what I wanted to do from an early time. And then I think the biggest thing was uh, in sixth grade, I had a, a teacher that was a World War II veteran. In fact, oh. most of my teachers were World War II veterans, as were, you know, my father and my uncles mm -hmm. and uh, all the men who founded our church and, and all of that. And so uh, I was interested in the war. Although I took a lot for granted because I was so inundated and surrounded by it. But I had a teacher that was a combat soldier and he brought artifacts into class and he made uh, the Second World War really come alive to me and I decided I wanted to be him when I grew <laughs> up. And so I, you know, I was pursuing a teaching role of some sort. Um, probably from the sixth grade on I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to go about it at that time, but as time went on, I did. <laughs> That's incredible. Now, where did you, where did you end up going to college? Uh, I ended up at a college in Western Ohio that had a really superb American history program uh, called Cedarville College. Now it's uh, Cedarville University, and their their history program was, I thought, second to none among Christian colleges. If you can use Christian as an adjective, uh, and I also wanted to play basketball in college and Cedarville gave me both kind of as a package and so the basketball paid for my history <laughs> lessons <laughs> you might say uh, there and then I went on and, and did my master's degree at the University of Dayton in Dayton Ohio and and I taught in between and and then I did my doctoral work at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. Now uh, was your, what was your your doctoral degree in? Uh, well, my doctoral program was in American history, Antebellum South was my specialty, um, and I never completed the work, so I'm not, I'm PhD, ABD, all but dissertation, I never wrote a dissertation, <laughs> so maybe we can count this interview. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what teaching jobs did you hold? You said you held, you taught between your degrees, but right. I know you also taught extensively after college. What were some of those I jobs did. you held? Uh, I, I taught in Christian, I taught in a Christian school. My first formal teaching job, full time, was in a, a Christian school in Ohio. And uh, after that, I taught at the University of Dayton. I taught military history at the University of Dayton. I taught at William and Mary. Um, 
But I also taught in other uh, Christian schools. I taught substituted in public schools. And then when we started having children, we homeschooled uh, all eight of our children. So I, we started a homeschool co-op, uh, which, we, which I, my wife and I ran for eight years. So for those of you who, who are listening who aren't familiar with uh, homeschooling that much, a co-op is like is, is when a group of homeschoolers get together and they meet regularly. Did you do it once a week? Or? Twice a week. Twice a week, and they get together. Um, I was in a co-op once a while ago, and we got together and we did community projects, and we, we sent out care packages for veterans, and I know some co-ops do different teaching. They, they get together and specialize, and they go through a book together, or they talk about different subjects, but that's what a co-op is. So you you homeschooled your eight kids for how long? How many years was that? Well, I guess we had uh, 30-some years, I suppose. Wow. So you, you kind of We started in 1981, huh. and we finished around 2015 or 16. Hmm. So what is that? <laughs> I'm not good in math. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> when, so, and after you, after you taught at these different schools, uh, these Christian schools and these public mm -hmm. schools, what, when did you begin working for Vision Forum Ministries, actually doing history tours? Well, um, I taught at <clears throat> different times over the years, but I also worked in various businesses also uh, to put food on the table. Uh, and as far as, uh, as far as doing the history tours, uh, a company from Texas, uh, Vision Forum uh, hired me to help lead history tours called Faith and Freedom Tours for <laughs> several years. And that started in the late late 1990s, and it went up until about uh, oh, 2000, around 2012, uh, right around in there, around 2012. And then uh, Landmark Events was founded by Kevin Turley. <clears throat> and the previous history tours, I did a lot of history tours on my own. I had my own touring company, if you will, uh, and I just did one a year with Vision Forum. It was a big, usually a, a week or two week tour. Uh, Landmark Events was uh, 12 or 13 tours mm -hmm. a year, and they asked me if I'd be the, the chief historian for Landmark Events. And so starting about 2012, I did that full time. I, I had done other things in the interim, different kinds of businesses and uh, history teaching and uh, running a history center in Atlanta and different mm. things like that. What are some of the places you visited with Vision Forum and, and Landmark? Uh, well, we have uh, conducted history tours in, uh, in Italy, uh, in Rome, Pompeii, uh, <laughs> other places in, well, let's see, in Switzerland, in Geneva primarily and in Paris, in France, and then Normandy, uh, studying the World War II campaign, right. Normandy campaign. D-Day. And then, yes, and then um, as far as European tours are concerned, in England, and especially in Scotland. We've done many, many tours in Scotland. It's our, kind of our specialty. And uh, Ireland as well. In the United States, multiple places, multiple sites. So what's been your favorite place, if you had to pick one, that you've toured internationally or domestically? I think my favorite tour uh, internationally by far is, uh, is Scotland. Although, you know, all the, Italian, all, all the European tours are interesting. Uh, Scotland's my favorite, and I've done it the most times because it, uh, it coalesces not just political and military history, but church history mm -hmm. quite a bit, which is an interest of mine, too. And uh, Scotland has a great deal to, to offer. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to your, your history tours and your teaching about it, you've also been in a number of documentaries. What are, what are some of the documentaries you've been in over the years? Uh, I've been in a documentary on the uh, Titanic, mm -hmm. on the miracle at Dunkirk, uh, let's see, on a Stonewall Jackson um, documentary that was primarily about his colored Sunday school and the churches that came as a result of that. Uh, there are probably a couple others if I 
stop to think about it. Those three come to mind right off the bat. Yeah. There have been a couple others. Huh. So the Titanic one, and you've you've been to Belfast, right, where the Titanic was built, is, yes. is that correct? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of our history tour. Was the was the Titanic documentary filmed there? It was not. Uh, it was filmed in it was filmed in the United States, and it was based quite a bit on interviews with historians, and there was a, a, a real strong message behind it too, for for especially for men. Hmm. So, now he, this is my favorite one of my favorite facts about Mr. Potter. You were also in the film Gettysburg. You mm -hmm. had an an appearance there. Now, what what you were an extra in that film? What part did you play though? Like what what army were you in? Okay. Um, the reenactment unit that I was a part of was the 1st Texas Infantry, and we had a just an excellent, uh, accurate reenactment re group, and we were invited to come there and film, although they didn't care what units you were really in. If you were Confederate or Union, it was important, mm -hmm. but, um, it, you know, it, it really didn't matter, uh, because we were there to film Pickett's Charge, so it was a, a week-long film shoot because we had 10,000 reenactors. So I wasn't necessarily portraying my unit. Um, in fact, we were, I think, in the 18th Virginia Infantry um, as far as the, the Gettysburg battle was concerned. And it was, uh, it took a week to film Biggest Charge, um, done in all kinds of segments. and. We were known, uh, the only th they didn't pay us to do this. Uh, they gave us gunpowder, and they fed us, and we set up our tents and slept in camps. And the only thing we really got was a little medallion that, that said um, Gettysburg on it, and a T-shirt that said <laughs> background artist. So, that, so that's, I was primarily a background artist. Uh, I, it was an elegant corpse in Pickett's Charge. Yeah, that's pretty much <laughs> so I didn't have any speaking parts along with 10,000 other people. Now, I have uh, watched the movie Trying to Find You before, and I think I found you in one shot. I forget what general it is, but one of the generals, there's a close zoom up <laughs> of one of the generals yeah. just before he gets shot off his horse. And I think I found you in that shot, but I'm not sure. If you've ever seen the movie Gettysburg. Yeah. I'm um, right behind General Garland when he gets, rides in front of the line. Yeah, I, so. think, I think that's the shot I found you. Okay, and now before we move on to the last history question, the last section of the interview, which will be the, we'll talk a little bit about different parts of history. I wanted to make a point about uh, Mr. Potter's book. He has a book called Beloved Bride, The Letters of Stonewall Jackson to His Wife. And uh, it's a great book. There's a link to it below this video to buy it. I highly encourage you to do so. Um, Stephen Lang, who played Stonewall Jackson in Gettysburg, excuse me, in Gods and Generals, and he played George Pickett in Gettysburg, he wrote mm -hmm. the foreword to Mr. Potter's book. It's a great foreword, and it's a great book. Like I said, I highly encourage you to buy it. Um, we were talking before this interview about Stephen Lang. He was also an avatar and a number of other movies, so I think it's I think it's really cool that he wrote the foreword to your book and you've said you've you talked with him before. So now Mr. Potter, uh we've learned a little bit about you and your work and your teaching on history and your tours. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some interesting topics from history because after all that's what you're all about, studying history, mm -hmm. teaching it to other people. Mm -hmm. So I want to just go over a few topics that tend to interest people or sometimes confuse people. Um, so for the first question I'd like to ask, did Christopher Columbus really discover America, like the United States of America as we know it today? Well, uh, no. Yeah, he discovered, he discovered <laughs> some Caribbean islands for himself and for Spain, but as far as Europeans uh, arriving on the shores of North America, that that occurred uh, centuries before uh, Columbus. Uh, the Norsemen, um, Vikings, if you will, uh, had certainly landed in North America mm -hmm. and probably colonized uh, several areas. And there's evidence, there's archaeological evidence and other interesting factors that indicate other people, uh, perhaps from the Middle East even, um, had been in America prior to that. Hmm. 
So there, there's a lot of unknown. But uh, what is known that Columbus was really not the first European to set foot in North America. How many had preceded him is unknown, but as far as the empire of Spain was concerned, he's the one who uh, first began mapping, mapping the Caribbeans. Uh, Columbus never actually set foot on mainland what became the United States. Hmm. Um, and how do we know this today? Well, he kept very uh, voluminous diaries. Um, he wrote, he wrote everything down, hmm. his motivations, his, uh, the technical things. Uh, and it wasn't long after him when Spanish explorers and adventurers came and, and began landing in North America, hmm. certainly. Now, moving ahead a couple hundred years, I think sometimes we think of the founding, the American founding fathers as just a bunch of old guys with wigs, and that seems to be the stereotype. Is this an accurate assessment of them? Well, they're only old from our perspective. Uh, in their day, they were in their 20s and 30s <laughs> primarily, uh, so they were young men with wigs. Uh, and the men who declared independence and signed the, the Declaration of Independence, the men who uh, composed the Constitution of the United States. Some of the, a few of them were the same, the same men a few years later. They were perhaps the most uh, educated and distinguished group of American, uh, they weren't just intellectuals. Uh, most of them, the majority of them were lawyers, but some were other types of professions and, and including farmers and others. But it was the most, uh, probably the most distinguished collection of American thinkers in, uh, in history, hmm. and they all came together at a particular, a particular time in God's providence uh, to, uh, in the end, de declare the independence of, United, of uniting the states uh, and creating the United States of America. Hmm. So they were, they were young men, they were well-educated men, most of them were wealthy, uh, extremely wealthy. They had a lot to lose in what they, in what they did. And uh, certainly their political thinking and their political theories are still quite worthy of our consideration, and they are the basis for the republic that they established. It's interesting, they, you know, they did not like democracy at all. They agreed with what Cotton Mather had said, democracy is a poison. And they definitely were not designing some sort of democratic uh, system of government it was uh, definitely going to be a republic and could be called a democratic mm -hmm. republic since people can elect their representatives uh, that make the laws but uh, they were they were brilliant men establishing a republic mm -hmm. and it's uh, of course come down today to a, a lot of change from that mm -hmm. original founders ideas but they enshrined it in the Constitution and that's been the basis of our uh, law since those days yeah now Something I think for a while I was confused about too is what what was the difference between a democracy and a republic as the founders understood it? Because I think we kind of tend to blend those words together today without making a lot of distinction, but they obviously mm -hmm. did make a lot of distinction because of what the quote you just said, democracy is poison versus founding a republic. So what's the difference as they understood it? Well, they, they were classical scholars. They, they had studied the ancient, they studied the Greeks. Uh, they'd studied Athenian democracy. Uh, they understood that uh, if one more than half is the origins of law, uh, nothing but tyranny uh, and disaster can result. And that technically that's what democracy is, is the majority becomes the basis of law. And they, uh, they hated and feared that idea, as did all the monarchies of Europe and and others. There had been one brief experiment in a republic, you might say, in England with uh, Oliver Cromwell. But uh, these were men who had, had studied the past and took what they believed was the, the good parts of it, whether it be Greek or uh, Greece or Rome, or especially the Old Testament and the Bible. And they um, realized that the source of law needed to be, uh, needed to be a fixed uh, a fixed source, a fixed document, if you will, uh, and that is why the uh, originally the Articles of Confederation and then uh, then the Constitution of the United States established a foundation upon which 
uh, all laws had to be based. And so uh, a representative form of government was what they saw as the most, uh, the most effective and efficient way to govern and, and to give people a say-so in how they are governed uh, yeah. by their representatives. And so they, they did establish a, a republic in which elected representatives uh, under the Constitution uh, decide the laws, whether doing it well or doing it poorly, uh, whether admitting to the ideas of the founders or trying to discard them altogether. Um, nonetheless, the system is still um, in place and, and effective. Yeah, and I think some people, I think a lot of people just, I was, I, I understood it like this, why I just thought democracy meant the people are free to vote. The people have the ability to choose their elected officials. Mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of people mean when they say democracy. Now, right. Democracy is so important. So I think for a lot of people, it's just they're not aware of that fact, so they don't. It's it's hard to um, to go back to what the original meaning of democracy meant. So when we hear the founders say no democracy, that kind of confuses us. It's kind of counterintuitive <laughs> because of the right. way it's been passed down today. Sure. But anyway, and now let's let's move on to the 1800s. Everyone has usually taught that slavery was the cause, the start, the, the reason the Civil War started in America. What are some of the other reasons that this war came about? Well, uh, I think I would typically, when I'm asked, what do you think are the causes of the Civil War? I try to reframe the question, why did, why did seven Deep South states secede from the Union? Um, what motivated them to actually leave the Union? And I think the answer is, I think the answer is complex, uh, and it includes uh, the defense of the what they called in that day the peculiar institution uh, of slavery. So, uh, as far as the founders of the Confederacy were concerned, uh, part at least part of their thinking, especially the, the planters, uh, were thinking to preserve the institution of slavery, which they believed was. Uh, under attack, which it, indeed it was, uh, by various forces, in, political and social forces in the North. Um, so to say slavery is the cause of the Civil War, um, I think that's, I think it's inaccurate to, to state it that way. There were lots of factors that um, had divided the country. That was one of them. Um, but uh, certainly the uh, certain, econ uh, certain other kinds of economic issues, too, uh, come into play, especially the, the tariff. Uh, the tariffs are taxes on imported goods, and the burden of that fell much more heavily on the South than the North. And they, they wanted, the South therefore wanted low tariffs because uh, they were a producer of agricultural products that became the manufactured products. Um, so there was uh, so that that particular issue, and I would say too that there had developed since, well over the over the century, uh, I think there were some cultural and social divisions that had taken place. The value system of the South, I think, was uh, was different. What actually united the country? There was only one institution that that was the same across the all the states, and that was the church the Christian church in its various denominational forms. And that really was the only institution that every American kind of had in common, although not every American was a church member, um, perhaps 40%, something like that. But church attendance was huge. Church membership was a little more difficult. But it was the one, one institution that held the country together. So when the church is divided, uh, when the Methodist Church and the Baptist Church is divided in the 1840s, um, it was, uh, as uh, John C. Calhoun said, it's only a, a matter of time before the states are going to divide. Once the church has uh, broken into these uh, different parts, mm -hmm. it's, it presages the, the dividing of the country. So I, I would say that's definitely a factor, too. Uh, and they and they divided over the issue of slavery. I mean that was that was at the bottom of the, you know, of their their action. So that it comes into play as a factor in the division of the church, mm -hmm. um, also. And um, 
you know, with cultural divisions, economic uh, oppression as the South perceived it, and the, the attempts of the North to um, try and force the South to conform. The biggest issue that I think that brought about secession, or there were a couple triggers. One was uh, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. I think historians, there's a, it's kind of a consensus that after that there was, there was no way the country wasn't going to divide uh, when Bloody Revolution was brought to Virginia. Um, I think there was a lot of misunderstanding between the North and the South, too, that, that brought about secession. I think they perceived each, other's, each other in a wrong way and differently uh, in, in some cases. And it's sad that so. that ended in 600,000 plus deaths. And um, one of the worst memories I think our country has of itself. Uh, but, but that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's a complex answer because there's so much to it and there's so many books that have been written about right. just single issues and books written about the South beforehand, uh, before the war and how culturally it, it led up. And I mean, there's so many issues involved. And um, Well, I think the one issue, one of the issues that needs to be discussed more is did the South have the right to secede from the Union? You know, if, if there was a constitutional right to secede, uh, then the North making war against the South puts the 750,000 or however many deaths there were, uh, I think, in the camp of the, the Congress and the President for making war uh, where it wasn't uh, constitutionally necessary. Or and if there, for. and so. if there wasn't any, um, if there was a barrier to secession, then it, it flip flops. I guess that's the way the argument goes. Yeah, I would say goes. if secession's unconstitutional, mm -hmm. then. Uh, then it's it's what the northern government said it was mm -hmm. a rebellion, mm -hmm. you know, it's a civil insurrection. Right, and then in so. in 1865, shortly after the war ended, the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was passed, which officially abolished slavery. Correct. And yeah. after that, as as many of you know, many leaders rose up to I think keep advancing the cause of equal rights until ultimately, of course, the climax of Martin Luther King Jr and the civil rights movement. One of these people, who's one of my favorite people from history, was Booker T. Washington. Do, what impact did he have on equal rights for, for blacks? Well, uh, Booker T. Washington comes into history uh, fairly well after the Civil War, uh, into the late 19th, early 20th century, in terms of his, his impact and significance. And I think that uh, Washington was Washington was interested in the races getting along, uh, but especially in the rural black community that needed um, needed motivation and skills and opportunities to increase to improve their lot. And so he didn't spend a lot of time uh, trying to change the political situation in the various states that had laws that were prejudicial uh, against black citizens. And they were called Jim Crow laws, and they were designed to prevent them from having political power and political influence, as well as, as so-called so social equality uh, in the public uh, square. And so he, he didn't fight that. Uh, that. That wasn't the why he disagreed with it. He didn't make that the, the heart of his message. He was positive. The heart of his message was the black man is not going to be equal uh, until he can you know, become economically independent and viable and get out of the kind of the trap that they were they were in in southern agriculture and mm -hmm. other areas and so uh, his message was a real positive one to try and assist uh, people of his own and I remember reading that in his he's got an autobiography it's called up from slavery um, I'm sure you've read it before mm -hmm. and I think that's the tone I got that there, there's another man I've heard of named W.E.B. Du Bois, yes. and 
I think they were on completely opposite ends of the spectrum because Washington was advocating in his book, let's let's work with it, let's accept it as it is now with the knowledge that most likely it's going to change, that there's going to be more rights for us, but for now let's, I think his focus was on education. I think that what the, the, a lot of what I got from his autobiography was that he thought the most important thing for black citizens of the United States right. during his time was becoming educated because many slaves while they were in bondage were not allowed to weren't able to read they didn't have access to right. you know, libraries and things like that and then you had leaders on the other end of the spectrum who were urging reform now and let, let's get this done and of course all this all these issues lead right up to Martin Luther King Jr. who I think found the balance between those two people found the balance between going all in and being violent in protests but being more forceful in actually getting the laws signed and getting the changes mm -hmm. made. But anyway, thank you for making that point. That's an interesting person. And Booker T. Washington is fascinating if you want to read more about him. And so we're coming to the end, but right now we're going to talk about one of the most interesting things I think about all of World War I. And there's so much that goes into that war, but there's one point that has been touched on briefly in other books, um, but it still fascinates a lot of people today. Uh, can you tell us the story, Mr. Potter, of the Zimmerman telegram during World War I and that its significance? Mm -hmm. uh, the United States didn't enter World War I until 1917, so the war had been raging for three years in Europe uh, with millions of casualties, and the United States had determined to stay out of the war. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was committed to uh, keeping America within our own shores and not getting involved in this conflagration that was consuming in a whole generation of men. But through those three years <clears throat> before the U.S. entered the war, uh, both the Germans and the English were courting America to, to join on their side, or in the Germans' case, just not to help England with, uh, with supplies. And Clandestinely and behind the scenes, uh, the United States was sending all kinds of support to England. Kind of like during World War II, right? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it was like in World War II. Uh, and there are a lot of controversial things that, that took place, the sinking of Lusitania, you know, the, the question of whether the U.S. was shipping arms to England in the bowels of the Lusitania or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Germans having warned Americans not to board that ship, and mm -hmm. having evidence that it was, you know, violating international law, et cetera. So uh, a, a number of incidents occurred that indicated the United States was favoring England, right. Right. but the government was not going to come out on the side of the Allies uh, publicly and materially because so many Americans were of German heritage, mm -hmm. and some believed almost 40%. Uh, so there was a great deal of sympathy for the uh, for the German for the Germans. Uh, most Americans didn't blame the Germans for starting the war. Uh, that's going to come. That's going to come later. Historians are going to put the whole war on Germany uh, for various reasons. But in in America during those there's years, there's a great deal of sympathy for Germany. Now the other factor that comes into play is the propaganda machines of Germany and England who are trying to court the American people, persuade them to be supportive of their side. And the English were masters at, at propaganda. And they also, they also had the ear of a lot of the, the newspaper editors. And so the, the, the way most Americans got their news was through the newspaper. And everybody, everybody took the papers. So the, as far as the news was concerned, news from Europe, the causes, the issues involved, America trying to remain out of it, it, it came primarily from reading the newspapers and to a lesser extent other, other news organs. And Americans uh, kind of chose sides based on their heritage. You know, a lot of people had sympathies for France and you know, come millions of people had sympathies for Germany. And so the gov U.S. government, let's go stay out of it. Let's keep our country united. You know, be careful. It's, but at the same time, 
uh, I think there was some very official and sub rosa uh, support for the Allied cause uh, against the Central Powers. And so, as I said, a number of incidents occurred that the British propagandists used and Americans sympathetic to the Allied cause used to try and sway American public opinion in favor of the Allies. And the incident that probably broke, really broke the sympathy, any residual sympathies for Germany, for most people, was this Zimmerman telegram. And what it was, was a very maladroit German thing to do, uh, is they made an offer uh, to Mexico to give them back the land that the Americans had taken away from them if they would invade the United States and continue and you know start a war that would pull the United States to the right, borders yeah. with Mexico uh, and keep them occupied keep keep the Americans occupied so that they and it was it was a stupid thing to do to send this telegram uh, but the British the British intercepted it in some way and got the information to the American newspapers and it was the front page I bet, story yeah. now the, the, the biggest thing that brought America into the war was unrestricted submarine warfare when the, the Germans started sinking any ship uh, became fair game any ship uh, that was heading toward the war zone uh, faced being sunk and I, I think that's what the government used to persuade Congress to declare war what, what uh, Wilson uh, used primarily the unrestricted submarine warfare. But the Zimmerman telegram was one of those things that enraged the people who wrote letters to their congressmen and took to the streets to protest the fact that the Germans were working to get a, America into a war with Mexico. And it wasn't even a realistic possibility that did, that could happen. Yeah. Did Mexico actually get the telegram? Uh, they, they did, but did you know what their response was to it? Did they blow it off? Did they? Uh, I don't know. It would have been it would have been suicidal. Uh, it had absolutely no merit to it as far as a strategy. So Germany was it. suggesting just invading the southern border, like New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, maybe Southern California, and I guess reclaiming some of the land that the U.S. stole, that took is... over, purchased a hundred. A hundred years before, well, maybe 50, 70 years before, under James Polk and other presidents. And yeah, the implication was that Germany would support you in this effort. Mm -hmm. We're going to win the war in Europe, and, and we can support you in doing this. And it was designed to keep the U.S. out of the war, because okay. uh, things were heating up uh, against, against the central powers in America. Mm -hmm. So the government was quickly drifting towards supporting the Allies. Mm -hmm. And the German spies knew all that stuff. and you know, the communication was, was going back. And so that, I think they saw the handwriting on the wall mm -hmm. as far as America's sympathies go. And this uh, ambassador's uh, telegram just was, uh, was a bad idea because it, it, it was really, it might have been the tipping point for the general American person who's just kind of paying attention to the war in Europe, but we're not in it, so I'm, and all of a sudden the Germans want to get the United States into a war with Mexico. Uh, I mean, the outrage was, and, and it was the front page news for, you know, weeks and weeks, and hmm. Congress uh, ended up being bombarded yeah. with protests. And so it made it easier when the president came to Congress to declare war. Zimmerman Telegram made it easy, an easy decision. Yeah, that's you know. that, that's a fascinating story. It's one of my favorites, isn't he? A great storyteller. I mean, I could just we could talk for so much about so many different topics. But as we come to the end, there's one more subject I'd like to talk with you about, and that's something that's I think it's been a little more it's talked about a little more recently because of different photographs that have come out, and and that's the disappearance of the legendary pilot Amelia Earhart. And a lot of people are aware of who she was. What was she trying to accomplish when this mysterious disappearance happened? Yeah, 
I've, I have not spent a lot of time in my life studying Amelia Earhart and what she was attempting to do, but my understanding is that um, she was convinced that uh, women could accomplish anything that men could, and because she, she was a flyer, um, she believed that uh, kind of saw herself as a representative of sort of the nascent women's rights mm -hmm. movements of the day. Uh, not necessarily suffrage, suffragettes, but uh, as far as, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, that, uh, you know, women had taken their place in athletics mm -hmm. and uh, different things. And she determined with her uh, partner to try and circumnavigate the globe, that is, fly all the way around the world. And, of course, she didn't make it. She disappeared somewhere in the Pacific. And there were lots of theories as to what, and then and now, since that time, as to what happened. Yeah, what are, what are some of those? What are some of the things people assume happened to her? I mean, because it's so such a topic of, I guess, controversy. Well, it's such a, such a vast area. I, I know when I was in high school, my history teacher uh, said that she had uh, flown over Japanese-held islands in the Pacific and had seen things that she wasn't supposed to see, and the Japanese shot her down. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was in the 19, early 1960s. I was, Amelia Earhart's story was one of the great mysteries and very interesting mm -hmm. one at, at that. Uh, because of who she was, and uh, that was the that was the theory that I got. But there have been so many articles and other things since that time. Um, it appears to me that she did crash land on an island, hmm. and it may have been one of the Japanese-held islands. But they, I think, they have found a few things over the years, a few artifacts that would indicate that the plane went down hmm. on an island. Uh, others thought that she went down in the ocean, may have run out of gas, or hit a storm. And, and it'd, just, be, it'd be hard to find her because the ocean. You'd never find it. No, you'd yeah. never, ever find it. But I think those who are interested in this topic and write books about it and such, I think the consensus is that she uh, crashed on an island, whether shot down or technical problems or what have you, but that, that she and Her assistant uh, went down on an, uh, an island, which may have been a Japanese-held island at the time. Yeah, and it's so. it's tragic that her life ended it's hard like to that. Say. It, it would so. have been sad enough if she had crashed and they had found her, but I mean, it makes it it makes it all the worse. But history, mystery. Yeah, history is full of things like that, sad, mm -hmm. uh, mysterious. Um, but we covered a few very interesting topics, I think, today. And once again, thank you so much for talking with us, Mr. You're Potter. Welcome. That was fascinating. You're like welcome. I said, I could talk. Anytime. I could sit for hours <laughs> talking about all these different topics. So, thank you. Don't go just yet, everybody. It's time for the... Mr. Potter, what is your favorite meal? My favorite meal? Um, buttered macaroni with uh, salmon patties and chocolate cookies. <laughs> favorite movie? Favorite movie, Master and Commander. Oh, yeah. No question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Favorite book? Mmm. Carrying the Flag. Uh, I mean, outside of, outside of the Bible, uh, um, I would say a, a book entitled Carrying the Flag. It's a book uh, written in, on the Civil War. <laughs> oh, and back to the favorite movie, Master and Commander. I remember well, I saw that with him on a battleship, the USS Alabama in, in Mobile. Right. We, we played that because that was on one of his history tours a while ago. But anyway, so favorite book, Carrying the Flag, favorite person from history. Favorite person? Ooh. I know, it's a hard <laughs> one on this one. <laughs> that, is, that is a hard one. How about from, I'll, give, I'll make it a bit easier, how about from 1775 on? Okay. Oh man. <laughs> probably, probably uh, Robert E. Lee. Hmm. I would say. Yeah, there's been a lot of controversy around him lately. <laughs> Favorite hobby? Well, I don't know if reading is a hobby. If reading's a hobby, that's my it's favorite. It's one of my hobbies. <laughs> I mean, that's that's my 
that's my favorite hobby. I get to do it as part of my job too. I mean, which I get to read the things that I want to read and get paid to do it. Hmm. Um, so I don't know if that's uh, it's what I would do if I wasn't doing. If I wasn't, if I didn't have to do it, I'd still be doing it. Mm -hmm. You know. And like so, he mentioned earlier in the video that you played basketball. I know you still right. You still shoot. I'd around like and, to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I chewed around. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that would have been uh, if you'd asked me that question ten years ago, probably would have been softball. Hmm. But <laughs> the sports was always a big part of my life until just a few years ago. So. Comment below and tell me who your favorite person from history is. Please give this video a thumbs up. Click that subscribe button and ring the notification bell to stay up to date with all of my videos. And until next time. Go learn your history.